Hello, everyone, uh, and thanks again for joining LRBS. And so awesome to uh, uh, to invite and have uh, Shane uh, Scriven here with us. Uh, he's the managing director of SAS uh, Asset Management. Super passionate about data, and he's going to talk to us about Mo Data, Mo Worries, unlocking the path towards better asset and asset management performance. Thanks, Shane. All yours. Hey, Josh. Thanks for having me. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, been really impressed with the, the quality of of the presentation so far. So I've got you know pretty pretty uh, steep hill to come up, um, but let's see how we go. I hope you enjoy this. A bit more of a, a technical reliability uh, presentation here today. So um, I'm really keen to get your questions. I'm going to hook through this. Um, so if you have a question, please put it in there. I love talking about this stuff. So as Josh uh, introduced. My name's Shane and I'm the owner and, and managing director of SAS Asset Management or SAS for short. Um, and it really is a privilege to have this opportunity to share some of our work with you, uh, whereby we've been able to help our clients better understand what that balance of risk, cost and performance looks like for their, for their assets in their operating context. Um, a bit of a, an intro to our company at, at SAS. We're, we're really passionate about creating a positive impact on the Australian community through responsible asset management. We go beyond uh, practices by meticulously selecting clients and scopes of work that align with our core value uh, by focusing um, solely on projects that deliver a net positive impact to the broader community. We drive sustainable growth and social progress. With our expertise and, and commitment to this social responsibility, um, we empower the organisations we, we do work for to make a difference while also achieving their own goals, their financial goals and performance goals. And we believe together that we can bring a brighter future uh, for Australia. So a little bit more um, about, about the, our scope of work um, to provide you with some additional context New South Wales Health and, and SAS have been uh, working through with each other um, through each of their six critical asset classes within their portfolio. So the local health district of Illawarra Shoalhaven it has a, a number of hospitals of different vintages and we've been helping them um, with their critical assets as, as listed up there. And today we're going to explore how we utilised a, a disciplined approach in the analysis of their hospital bed fleet and, we, and how we use this approach on, on all six of their critical asset classes. The disciplined approach, which we're going to explore um, further shortly, blends the de dependability techniques and skills with the asset management context and many of the steps that you'll see today are represented in a typical robust RAM engineering program. And seriously, if you'd asked me 10 years ago that I'd be applying the same approaches, tools and techniques that I've used on major infrastructure projects like Sydney Metro, Metro Trains Melbourne and Eddie Had Rail on simple hospital beds, I'd tell you we're dreaming. But the picture I want to, I want to paint for you here right now with this slide is the complete lack of technical data that was available to the team at Illawarra Shoalhaven. At this point, if I was to, if, if you would ask me, how do you eat this elephant, Shane? I'd simply have responded one bite at a time, but you'd have quickly come back to me and said, mate, where do we start? Um, so moving on um, here, I'd like to introduce um, the Asset Dependability Assurance Framework. It's an approach that um, we've, we've pioneered and we utilise for our clients, otherwise known as the ADAF. So the first step of the ADAF right at the top there um, is to use what we call the asset configuration review. And this determines what systems are within the larger system. We define those interactions and interfaces of those systems to understand how it, it is all comprised, how it's configured, what's the major configuration state for any system engineers out there. In other words, it's an asset hierarchy on steroids. The second step um, through from the ADAF, the, the FAMICA, if you're a reliability engineer there, is to, to use the team's subject matter experts 
recognizing from before that we had a complete lack of technical data, we used those SMEs to start to define and understand the risks of each of those subsystems um, and what they pose to the organization. Moving on, the third step, the BRA, uh, we start to understand what we can reasonably expect um, from the system from a reliability perspective. And this helps us prioritize effort moving forward. The fourth step, um, the MPD, is, is to develop a maintenance plan for each uh, asset, each as a hospital bed in isolation. So we've, yes, from the previous slide, we had over a thousand hospital beds in the fleet. We're going to create a maintenance strategy using reliability centered maintenance um, technique for one single hospital bed in, in, uh, in isolation. However, in the fifth step, the, the ACA, um, we're going to start to understand how that isolated maintenance plan performs across the fleet, recognising we've got multiple assets. You'll see there uh, a little feedback loop uh, between the ACA and the NPD, which represents the tailoring of maintenance plans once we run the, the ACA. The sixth step of the ADAF um, starts to understand the resource requirements um, of that tailored maintenance plan for the fleet, whilst the seventh step there, the, the, the MTS, starts to design what starts to define part of me, what tasks are done by whom and under what procurement. Do we insource these tasks or are we better to package it up and put it out to market and outsource it? Pay a little bit more, pay a higher premium, but de-risk ourselves a little bit. What does that look like? And finally, the last step in the approach where all of this gets finally slammed together into a life cycle cost analysis to better understand the future funding requirements um, for the given risk performance and cost profiles. So that's pretty cool. Um, let's go into this a little bit further now. And like I said, I'm going to hook through this um, substantially. But look, if you've got a question, please, please jump in. So the ACR... Well, the asset configuration review was undertaken with subject matter experts. As you can see there, we, we, we worked out and identified that there were four main configuration types present within the broader fleet. We had the general hospital beds, the bariatric hospital beds, um, which is for patients with mobility issues. Um, we had the birthing beds. And finally, we had the ICU intensive care unit slash high dependency unit HDU bed. We can see, um, you know, a couple of the system breakdown structures flick through there for each of the beds, and we broke those systems down into subsystems and components and defined that. As I said before, it was an asset hierarchy. However, we also defined the interfaces and the functions associated with each of those subsystems. So we're able to generate a thorough understanding of what each type of hospital bed looks like um, and at which system and what its subsystems functionality needed to be. And finally, um, probably the most valuable step at this juncture for the team, um, we worked with, with each hospital team um, to identify the population of each configuration type per Hospital. And I couldn't believe it, but this hadn't been done before. Um, the, certainly the asset management team um, did not fully understand, you know, their, their, what, what hospital beds were throughout their hospital. So it was a really powerful thing and pretty useful um, from day one for the team. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. So I'm going to skip forward now. Um, I'm going to go through past the, the boring um, for me and, and get into um, the BRA, the Baseline Reliability Assessment. And that really utilised the uh, occurrence scores from that FAMICA. And for those of you who are not across FAMICA, the occurrence of failure, the probability of, of failure of each failure mode, we use that um, as well as the system breakdown structures um, from the asset configuration review. And we slammed all that together into a series of reliability block diagrams and produced a reliability model for each uh, asset configuration type. And that model allowed us uh, to assess and predict what the reliability performance of each asset type was expected to be for the next one year period. The analysis helped us understand together with the complexity of the systems from those system breakdown structures and the anticipated probability or occurrence of failure from the FAMICA. 
we could understand from this analysis which subsystems and systems were more probable to have a better performance than others across that one year period, recognizing that some subsystems and so on and so forth have redundancy in them. And you know, when they fail, that it's not necessarily a service affecting failure. So we we're able to model that and really prioritize um, which subsystems and systems were, were more important moving forward. Furthermore, um, you know, we were able to use the BRA, and you can see up see up on the screen there for a simple one with, with uh, the birthing beds there. Overall, we're expected a 73%, 74% um, probability of, of success in a, in a one-year period. So pretty cool stuff, and we're able to, to do all that. Um, we've also got here a simple example for the ICU HDU beds. A little less uh, reliability expected out of those, predominantly due to their operating context. They get beaten around a fair bit, as you would expect. Um, so pretty cool stuff. So moving on um, into, into the next sort of step, um, we're talking about the, the maintenance plan development here and the ACA, the Availability Capability Assessment. And really this what this takes is it takes that work that we developed as part of the BRA the, remember I said the reliability models, and it, it applies a, a repairable systems approach and it grabs that maintenance plan that was developed in isolation using reliability-centred maintenance and it puts that on top of that availability, uh, uh, pardon me, on top of that reliability model to produce an availability model. So we suddenly have this repairable system. The primary difference between the BRA and the ACA is the ACA incorporates both the failures of the system in concert with the maintenance and repair of the system, whereas the BRA only looks at the failures of the system. So to undertake this analysis, the availability model um, was simulated a thousand times on a per hospital, per configuration type basis. It's a lot of simulations, using Monte Carlo simulations if you're across that. Um, we and the New South Wales Health Team um, defined within any hospital, um, within any hospital bed configuration type, that at any point in time, 90% of the beds should be available to be utilised at any point in time. So what we're saying there is the fleet utilisation target. We have a fleet of 100 beds. 90 of them at any point of time should be able to service the patient. So we call that the fleet utilisation target. And finally, on a system, as a system, on a per hospital basis, per configuration type basis, the final target availability should be 99.7% across an eight-year period. So what that means, to sort of sum all that up, is 99.7% of the time, Across an eight-year period, 90% of the beds should be available for utilisation. So flicking through here, you can see some of the results um, that were generated. I think up here we've got um, Shoalhaven Hospital. We can start to understand um, the, the performance expected of each of those systems, of each of those subsystems. And, you know, if you're really keen, um, we have component level availability as well. But really what I want to point point out to you here on this slide is that feedback loop between the ACA um, and the MPD. So this, this feedback loop really represents that after a, a 1,000 simulation tranche, we would go and look at that the results and, and more often than not, the, uh, the results would not achieve the 99.7% the availability target. And we go back and look at the maintenance plan and understand what's bringing that number down. And we tailor that. Either we were getting too many failures um, and, and it was bringing the, the um, reliability down or we were doing too much maintenance because recognising we've got that 90% fleet utilisation target, we can let some things fail. We can have 10% of our fleet out of services at, at any point in time. So we're actually able to take on a little bit more risk. We're also able to look at the, the spares holdings. And, you know, when you start to consider across 1,000 hospital beds, um, spare parts is a really important thing to, to be across. So we're able to look at that and look at what the optimal spare holdings were. We're also able to look at response times for maintenance, whether it be 
um, for breakdown maintenance or whether it be the time to undertake preventative maintenance. We're able to look at that and look at like the logistics delays of our spares as well and work with the suppliers. So I think from memory, after all that sort of feedback loop stuff, we, were, we ended up doing 250,000 um, or thereabouts individual simulations to achieve that target. And what that does is it provides assurance to New South Wales Health that they have an asset base that can deliver the performance they, they need at the given risk. So, you know, to summarise all of that, what we did was we took that isolated maintenance strategy using reliability-centred maintenance, isolated to one asset, and we ran it through simulations, recognising that that asset um, and that maintenance strategy is part of a fleet. And we developed that, that and tailored that strategy such that the system can re, um, achieve its, its final target. So it was pretty cool. A lot of work, as I said, over 250,000 sims. So finally here, all that, um, as I, I've hooked through this a little bit, but finally all that gets slammed in together as I introduced the ADAF into a life cycle cost um, assessment. It was pretty cool. We took basically right through from that ACR right through to the maintenance task um, strategy. We were able to slam all those in together into an eight year life cycle cost strategy on a per year, per hospital, per hospital bed configuration type basis. And really what that allows New South Wales Health, the Illawarra Shoalhaven Local Health District, what that enables for them is they can now go to New South Wales Treasury and say, we want to deliver this level of performance for our hospital beds, 99.7% availability across the eight-year period. And to do that, we require this funding. This is how we're going to spend that funding. It becomes a pretty powerful thing from an asset management perspective, but it also enables a trade-off. When New South Wales Treasury inevitably says, well, you can't have that, that that funding envelope. I can give you 90% of that funding envelope. New South Wales Health, Illawarra, Shoalhaven are, are able to go back and say, okay, well, if you give me 90%, well, this is the resultant availability that I'm going to give you. And that may be down at the 85%. So you can start to see the trade-off there. So I was really powerful, um, really proud of the work um, that we're able to do and, and really, um, really keen to, to explore any, any questions you have. I hope you've, you've enjoyed it. Um, Josh, have we got questions there that we'd like to uh, explore? Okay, so uh, so if you have questions out there, please, uh, there's a there's a question mark thing that you can ask the questions or even in the chat. Uh, yes. Feel free. Um, and I mean, I have a question, Shane. So um, this was a, a, a let's say, hyper-targeted case study on, on the hospital beds. Do you have, uh, have you seen this same type of data-driven um, uh, process in, in other like turbo machinery and, and plants? Sure, sure. It's used, um, used primarily um, in the transport um, industry, also defence as well, Josh, and some more, I suppose, nuclear energy side of things. It, it is um, quite a quite an undertaking um, to to do, and it requires a lot of discipline and, and dedication from the organisation to do. So, we were really lucky that um, the team at Illawarra Shoalhaven were able to fully commit and, and jump into this, and you know, recognising um, what you said just before. Yeah, whether or not we had all the data and the keen, the keen listeners in the audience will recognise this, they didn't have a lot of technical data. Um, so we had to make, make a lot of the data up um, from subject matter experts. But what that actually does is it provides them with a data model going forward, Josh, to, to fill in the blanks moving forward. So they're able to say, well, we need data in this space and we don't need data in this space because we don't think it's very critical. So it was really, really powerful for, for Illawarra Shoalhaven, Josh. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point, right? Because you, you don't want to measure things that have no impact, right? So right. It's, you want to identify the data points that matter. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, and we're able to say, well, from an asset management perspective, Josh, we're able to say, well, what decisions do we want to make? Like, as an asset management team, what decisions are, are required of us in the next eight-year period? And therefore, working back from that, well, what insights do we need? 
to make that decision. Okay, and then what information is required to make that insight? And then finally, to make that information, what data is needed, right? And we're able to make that sort of linkage into a, a robust data model. Fantastic. Wonderful. Um, anyone else in the audience have, have questions, comments? I, I think that's it, Shane. So um, just a, a quick announcement. Uh, so we have we have experienced uh, some slight technical issues. So we've readjusted the um, the agenda. So we're actually going to see Shane in in thirty minutes uh, talking about AI on our, on our panel. Um, but please refresh your um, the, the the LRVS backstage page to get the updated agenda. I think we're just shifting it by ten minutes or so. Um, for, for some of these presentations. Uh, so Shane, thank you so much uh, for, for this awesome uh, uh, Mo Data, Mo Worries uh, presentation, uh, and I love the title. And we'll see you soon on the, I think, 1230 Singapore time. Thanks. Um, in the next panel. Been a lot of fun. Okay. Thank you.